Okay, now I'm excited to welcome and introduce our presenters this afternoon. Dr. Linda Gennon, Chief Medical Officer, and Ann Kent, Chief Growth Officer of Progeny Health. As Chief Growth Officer, Ms. Kent is responsible for leading the strategic and tactical growth of the company. As an executive leader with over 25 years of operational leadership, clinical oversight, business development, and growth driving experience, it is her roots as a clinical social worker that serve as her foundation to facilitate change improving the disparities and inequities around health and access to health care. As Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Geddon oversees medical management and quality operations at Progeny Health. As an experienced physician executive who is focused on maternal child health, Dr. Geddon serves as Senior Research Fellow for United Health Group Research and Development prior to joining Progeny Health, helping to advance research and develop innovations in healthcare. Prior, prior to moving to research and development, she served as the Chief Medical Officer for women's health at Optum, overseeing fertility, maternity, and NICU programs. Anne and Dr. Gennon will be presenting today's webinar titled Postpartum Strategies, Driving Equitable Outcomes While Reducing Costs of Care. With that, I'm excited to turn things over to Anne. Thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon. Welcome, and, and thank you. Thank you to MHA, um, MHPA, it's a mouthful, for both the partnership, and thank you for those of you in this virtual room for choosing to spend some time with us and, and your interest. Today's conversation is focused on maternal and infant health, postpartum strategies that contemplate equitable outcomes while reducing the cost of care. Certainly COVID um, illuminated, uh, shined a very bright light on both the inequities in this area and, and highlighting that we must do better to support our moms to be, our moms and their babies. So this is core to the work that we do at Progeny, and it has been core to what we've been doing for, for nearly 20 years. This is the work we have been committed to for a very long time. When Dr. Stang founded this company, she did so through the lens of both a pediatrician and as a medical director of a health plan. She had experienced in both her practice and within her health plan work a system, a healthcare system that, that could do better and that could be better, specific to maternal and infant health. Dr. Stang saw a path. She saw a path to not only improving the quality of care and health outcomes, but a path to decreasing the cost of care. There's challenges around the lack of standardization, poor consistency, rising NICU costs, and a lack of NICU focused support for the caregiver that were very real world challenges. So many of these moms and caregivers and, and families and babies were falling through the cracks, right? Social determinants of health, social drivers of health. Those were not as common in our vernacular 20 years ago as they are today, but they've always been rooted in the work of progeny as in our work with these families. How do we make it bigger just over here? Health equity, access to care, a theme throughout today's conversation as well. So Ellie's goal, Dr. Stang's goal, was to build a program that would cover- Yeah, like, I, oh, I see what you're saying, okay. Maternal infant health. Okay. And Linda, I think you are um, not on mute. Yeah. Um, her goal was to build this program to address all of these issues, and she did. We have continued to hone and refine that work over the years. She continues that voice as a trustee with the March of Dimes and the important work that Stacey Stewart is leading. And that's one of the reasons that Dr. Gennon and I are talking about this today. It's all in alignment with our purpose to improve the health and well being of the next generation, one family at a time. So, this isn't a new focus for progeny. And the increased awareness and visibility and acknowledgement of the need to collaborate across our organizations is getting to get to action has been critical. So in the next slide, we'll talk about what, um, what this means from a managing through um, the whole continuum of care, this notion of case management and care management, because it's our history and those insights of our history that inform our clinical works teams every single day. And um, Dr. Ginn and I are setting the stage for today's conversation around postpartum strategies because of this work this notion of a whole person approach, a care management approach across the integrated continuum is critical as we talk about ways to impact maternal morbidities. It's a prevention strategy. So I highlighted our deep experience in working with mothers and NICU babies and their families over these last couple of decades. We know from our history and in real time, the importance of engaging as early as possible with a mom-to-be. If I can't engage, I can't have an impact, right? Because a healthy pregnancy tends to translate to a healthy newborn, and that tends to translate to a healthy family. Yes, 
there will be a premature or complex birth and that will be addressed as well. The infant and the mother and the mother. Both need attention. It's that lens of pre-birth all the way through 12 months postpartum that's important. And it's particularly important as we think about postpartum strategies. So our time together, the agenda. Bit of a long preamble, but I also wanted you to have a sense of our history here and why we feel um, we bring an important voice to this conversation. We will spend a few additional minutes just on maternal and infant health data points, our perspective on a whole person approach and how that is so critical to our work. We'll also then talk about the postpartum um, programming as strategies, talk about some of our best practices, but also some feedback from you on the work that you have done that has worked and challenges you have had, had as well. We'll shift our focus to <clears throat> how do we impact outcomes before postpartum, right? Recall that engagement comment earlier that the more, the quicker we can get to the mom to be, the early in that initial trimester, that first trimester, how important that influence can make in postpartum results. Then some Q&A, um, certainly questions and hopefully some answers as well. Now, first polling question. Are we ready? Everybody at your buzzer. I feel like it's now it's turned into a game show. First polling question. Um, what percentage of maternal morbidities occur during the postpartum period? So, Patrick, there we go. All right. Linda and I can't vote. <laughs> how, are, how are we doing, Patrick? Are we getting some people? Here we are. Ready? We're getting All great right. participation. Excellent. Still have some time, folks. Yes, yeah, this is wonderful. This is going to be interesting. All right. Let's let's reveal. Let's reveal. Uh, Okay, last chance. I'm sorry, and they're still they're still oh, voting. Okay. I don't want to cut All them right. off. All right. All right. All right. I'm curious. I'm curious to see how close they are. Here we go. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. So, so thank you. So um, we can go ahead and close that out. And um, and it was a nice distribution. Um, Fifty-two percent. Is is the right answer? Um, is the right answer in in um, in all of this? Fifty two percent of maternal morbidities occur after delivery. Now I do appreciate the optimism in terms of some of the other bucketing. That means we have some more optimistic views that it might be seventeen percent or twenty one percent or forty percent. In addition to fifty two percent of these maternal mor morbidities occurring after delivery or postpartum, nineteen percent of all maternal deaths are occurring between one and six days postpartum. How do we impact these maternal morbidities? The biggest factor really is around early identification, enrollment, risk stratification. Um, all of these show that we can have an impact earlier. So let's go to the next, <clears throat> let's go to the next slide. All right, so just a minute, catch up with myself here. Um, if you go back just one slide, um, Linda, that we want to talk about that, that what's happening at the healthcare stakeholders level. There's no question that healthcare stakeholders are finally doubling down on improving maternal and infant health. It begins at the highest level, as you see here, and has resulted in focused initiatives around policymakers, providers, payers, and community-based organizations. One of those focal points is expanded postpartum coverage, right? Some of what and I think many of you on this call is I've seen some of the, the residents are very aware of, um, and it's for good reason. This notion of a, at least a fourth trimester is critical. In fact, um, thinking of, um, speaking of Secretary Becerra, I've heard from several friends who were out in, in Las Vegas this week at Health 22, heard him talking about this on stage just yesterday. So certainly an important, an important conversation. The statistics, right? The data points. None of these statistics will come as a surprise to anyone attending this webinar. Um, you, you likely know these numbers as well as we do and all of the other subsequent data points. That greater than 80% of pregnancy related deaths in the US are preventable. That the US maternal mortality rates are twice as high as even Canada. And in the US, if you are black or brown, your mortality rate triples or quadruples. These figures point to challenges around health and equities and systemic bias, quality of care, clinical practices, access to care, an area even highlighted by Papa just last week in another webinar around prenatal care. We talk about food deserts, we talk about pharmacy deserts, there are maternity deserts too, and, and the overall lack of comprehensive care management. So on some of these challenging notes, these bleak notes, if you will, I'm gonna pass this virtual baton to Dr. Gannon to talk a little bit more about these issues in the context 
of maternity programming. Dr. Gunning. Thanks, Anne. So we're gonna dive in with another poll, actually. So our second polling question is, what percent of women had any visit for primary prevention, including routine postpartum or health maintenance visits and visits for contraceptive care after delivery? So let's see how we do on this poll. All right, we're getting great responses again. All right. All right, folks, got a couple more seconds. Okay, going once, going twice, let's share. Okay, so you're gonna be surprised with the answer then. So the answer is actually quite high. It's number C or letter C, I should say, 55 to 78%. So when you think about our high maternal morbidity rates, until we see this increase in postpartum visits, we're gonna to continue to have issues with postpartum morbidity. And we know that every morbidity is a missed opportunity. So engaging postpartum will help prevent some of these unfortunate outcomes. So let's talk about implementing a postpartum strategy. And we have three pillars. One is to build trusted relationships with members. And that is key because that sets you up for success in an honest, non-judgmental relationship. Two is we're taking a whole person, whole family approach. So it's not just about the mother, but it's about the mother, her partner, the father and the baby, that whole person, family approach. And what are the things that are affecting them? And then three is drive postpartum care and deliver ongoing support. And that's really key as we think about, we've moved medically or clinically into a fourth trimester. We're moving further downstream and supporting families for many months till the first year of life after they've delivered. We're gonna dive into each of these pillars as well. So step one, building trusted relationships is extremely important because when you have a trusted relationship, you can share details that you may not feel comfortable sharing with your midwife, doula, or obstetrician in a quick 10 minute visit. So we have, we're very lucky in that we have high enrollment and engagement rates compared to industry benchmarks. And why, why is that? It's because of that trusted relationship with their care manager. And their care managers are establishing that honest, open, non-judgmental communication. We have nurses, labor and delivery room nurses and social workers. So people who've seen all sorts of problems and have solution for those problems. We take a whole person, whole family approach. So we're going beyond just the clinical issues that women are facing. We do a health risk assessment so that we can identify those clinical issues, but then we're also identifying behavioral health issues and social determinants of health, health inequities such as literacy issues, not understanding the language that people are hearing in their visits, as well as solving for transportation to even get to a visit, for example. And so Anne had mentioned how this whole person approach is really in our DNA. It's applicable from day one in our program. I'm gonna give you two examples. We're gonna talk about Katrina. So Katrina identified two high-risk issues in her health risk assessment. One, she had a BMI over 40. So obesity is one of her big issues. And two, she had a history of hypertension, high blood pressure. She did not have a blood pressure cuff or availability one, and she was very concerned about her delivery. She engaged with us actually, um, postpartum, we were able to get her an OB cuff. She unfortunately had a cardiac arrest due to a high epidural block during her delivery. And that resulted in an emergency C-section and she ended up in the medical ICU for a day. So she was very sick and was disconnected from her baby while she was recovering. She also was given support by our case manager to use the blood pressure cuff to monitor and record her blood pressure and to then reach out if the blood pressure hit certain high areas. And she was 
encouraged by the case manager and supported to keep those OBGYN appointments postpartum because this was an issue that wasn't just going away after she delivered. So it was really important. We connected her as well to pediatric providers so that her baby could get the care that he needed postpartum. Another example is Fatima. So Fatima discussed with her case manager that she had had significant anxiety and depression with her first pregnancy. However, there was a huge stigma in her culture. She's Muslim and in the Muslim society, she shared that it's very taboo to have this kind of behavioral health issue and to even seek out help for it. So she had a very limited support system when it came to this behavioral health issue. And she was very afraid because she knew she was at risk for having postpartum depression again with her second pregnancy. So she additionally had just immigrated to the United States from Saudi Arabia. So really was setting up a new support system in her area and didn't have a lot of help. So our case manager was very empathetic, heard her concerns, and they worked on a plan so that Fatima would have adequate support and engagement with someone who would address her mental health concerns before she delivered. She actually, Fatima met with her case manager five times in the first seven weeks of her program enrollment, and they set up a plan so that she would have someone she was engaging with throughout the pregnancy, as well as after the pregnancy. And so this, for me, this situation really speaks to meeting members in their own setting and culture and what they're dealing with. And having that relationship enabled Fatima to be honest and share something that may not have been very easy to share with anyone else in her inner circle. And one of the other things we know that exists are some issues with bias. We know that there has been a highlight of racism and inequity in healthcare, and we're trying to solve for that as clinicians as well as in case management. And so things that we're doing are to coach the member to be their best advocate, which is extremely important. And we can then engage as well and let the providers know that this person is having some concerns. We can notify the health plan also of any identified issues. So there's really a circular approach that we're involving the health plan, the member, and the provider. As we look at postpartum care and delivering that ongoing support, we want to make sure that nothing is missed, that we are catching all the gaps after delivery. We know that 53% of maternal deaths occur after delivery, and some not until six months or more afterwards. So what we're doing is making sure that members are attending their postpartum visits. These visits are important because they provide education and they help support the member as they move on in their journey. So we're touching base with those members and making sure that questions are answered, we're preparing them for visits and we're empowering them to ask questions so that they don't just look at that visit as a 15 minute to do on their list and not attend. So that's very important. And we're making sure they adhere to a care plan and taking any medications. One of the biggest issues we've seen is in scheduling. And so we have our social worker and our, mem and our case managers helping with scheduling. Sometimes it's hard just to get an appointment timely after delivery. And that's something we've definitely worked to solve. We're gonna go into another story actually about postpartum depression. And this was a member who was screened positive during questionnaire over the phone. And she was open to seeing a behavioral health specialist actually. And so the health plan sent the member a list of the participating providers, and she was to choose. Our team followed up with her two days later, and she was unfortunately very overwhelmed. And she really needed assistance, not only finding a provider, but making an appointment. And it really highlights what happens when you're dealing with a behavioral health situation, even a simple task can seem daunting. And that's what we discovered in this situation. So our social worker actually found an in-network provider and made the appointment and then made sure she was able to attend the appointment and she did. So these are simple things that someone else might be able to tackle but seem overwhelming to someone in a crisis. And so it's very important to have a diverse 
skill set on our team. I'm very impressed in the social work support and the case management support because they're able to solve these problems. Okay, so let's talk about impacting outcomes. And we, we really are very grateful here that more and more postpartum coverage is extending in the United States for that first year of life, that it's not just for a few months after birth. So we're thankful to see more and more states do a Medicaid expansion approach. At the same time, we also wanna move upstream because we know it's important to take care early on because that's gonna set us up for the best outcome. So we want healthier moms and healthier babies to start with. So we're gonna go into another polling question because these are fun. And this is not, um, it, this is a difficult one. I'm gonna tee it up because it's hard to pick one, but for this platform, we're picking one. What's the most important maternal health area in your organization that you should focus on to better impact postpartum care? And so there's several choices here, behavioral health, social determinant of health resources, chronic condition management, postpartum access, and parenting education and return to work. So we'll see what the group thinks is most important. We should sing. <laughs> like something from Jeopardy should come up. That's right. Dee, 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 dee. I'm not allowed to sing, so I won't go there. Okay. I think we have about everybody going right. once, going twice. And folks, don't forget, you can ask questions using the Q&A. We love your participation. All right. Let's last chance. We had a couple more. Okay. Oh, interesting. So 45% social determinants of health. Very interesting. And the second runner-up is behavioral health. And those are definitely extremely important. And the ones that we are quite honestly solving for more than I ever anticipated. As um, So there is no right answer, just so you know. They're all important. And if we could solve all of them for everyone across America, we'd have much better outcomes. All right. So let's talk about something that has become quite relevant and is unfortunately an issue is maternity deserts and access to care. So what is a maternity desert, right? So maternity desert is any county in the United States without a hospital or birth center offering obstetric care and without any obstetric providers. And this has been a, a huge issue. March of Dimes did a great report just recently in the last couple, just came out last month, I believe. We have more than 2.2 million women of childbearing age living in maternity deserts. That's 1,119 counties that do not have any obstetric care. And that should make you concerned, makes us concerned. 36% of all US counties designated as maternity care deserts, right? So that's, that's 36% of all of our US counties. That's terrifying. Um, at the same time, 150,000 babies were born in maternity deserts. Medicaid covers nearly 50% of births in maternity deserts compared to 40% in full access areas. We know that women in maternity deserts have poor outcomes. They're more likely to smoke, have asthma, hypertension, alcohol. So they already are in a situation where they're set up for failure. So certainly a concern. So in October of 2020, JAMA put out an article about what a survey, essentially, a nice little article, not a um, looking at why women don't go to postpartum visits. And there were surprisingly reasons, as you read the article, the participants believe that routine prenatal visits, first of all, didn't provide meaningful health benefits. They didn't feel reassured by their prenatal visits. They didn't feel it was worth the time to drive far away for a 10 to 15 minute conversation or visit where someone was just gonna tell them, your pregnancy looks great and things are moving along. She wasn't gonna waste her time on gas, one person said. And the other person said, I just, it's just not worth me taking time away from work where I might lose my job for a visit to tell me everything's fine. And I, this isn't my first rodeo show essentially. So, they didn't feel there was value. And I'm sure my OB colleagues would find this very disheartening. I know I did when I read the article. 
So as we look to get ahead and move upstream and ensure that women are going to prenatal visits, we're also looking to identify risk factors and how can we solve for those risk factors. So early identification and intervention is key. Having someone enroll in a maternity program in the first trimester is really a perfect scenario. Um, if we even engage before they get pregnant and set them up for success with proper nutrition, even better. We are identifying people through a couple of avenues. One is self-enrollment through digital apps or telephonically. Providers can refer them. So we've actually engaged with large OB practices and they love the program and they're happy to share information and sign people up in their offices. We also have health data coming in from health plans so that we're able to then identify and outreach to members using that information. Then we're stratifying into low, medium, and high risk. And so women are doing a health risk assessment in the app or on the phone. And that helps us determine where they fall in their risk and how much outreach is needed. And that's not just one and done. We're doing that risk survey repeatedly because someone can move from a low risk situation to a high risk. So someone can go from having no issues to being identified as having gestational diabetes, or someone can have no issue of blood pressure and have be diagnosed further down with preeclampsia, high blood pressure during pregnancy. So very important. So it's a very high touch and high tech. We're using digital information and apps, but it's really important that we have that personal touch because when you need to talk to someone, you need them there right then. And that's very important. The things that our nurses are doing is there's constantly educating members and helping them solve those problems and preparing them for visits and giving them information on health as, they, as questions come up during their pregnancy. So I know this phrase is not new to anyone, but knowledge is power and it makes a huge difference. Now, what happens if a member were to have a baby who ends up in the NICU? We've been in the world of NICU case management for over 20 years. And so we are right there. It's a seamless integration, thankfully. You can see that the integration starts when we identify members, we're engaging that member, and then after delivery, if a baby is admitted to the NICU, we're able to follow that baby and mother and continue the care all through the NICU stay. So there's continual collaboration during an extremely stressful time. No one plans to go into the NICU. No one even knows many times what the NICU is. So we're able to provide support. We um, are managing babies who have neonatal abstinence syndrome. And that can be very trying for a member because it sometimes takes a long time for the baby to go through that process. But we have social work who's helping the family through that and making sure they have the support when they go home. There's lactation support. So just as there's lactation support during pregnancy, we have it also in the NICU, which can be very challenging because when your baby's sick, you can't start breastfeeding right away. So you have to learn how to use a breast pump and that can slow down lactation. So we're engaging with the facilities and doing utilization management and case management as well and collaborating back to the health plan, transitioning those members when the time comes. So I'm gonna hop further here and do a case study. This is an example of this integration before delivery actually. So because we're engaging with mom, there are times prenatally that we know a baby will end up in the NICU. And in this case, mom found out that the baby had a significant heart anomaly and would need to be admitted to a NICU when born. So this, what was so important about this is we made sure that this woman was gonna deliver at a NICU, a hospital that had a NICU that was a level four NICU that had cardiac specialists who could address the needs of that baby and not have to have that baby transferred because transferring a fragile baby and separating that baby from the mother is very upsetting, quite honestly. And then the mother's recuperating and her baby's at another hospital far away. So that's one of the first things we make sure to connect them and that she has the right OB provider to deliver at a NICU that'll care for that baby. We connected her with her NICU case manager. So they had an introduction before 
delivery, so she had an established relationship. And we made sure she was being followed by maternal fetal medicine, so a high risk OB who knew how to navigate this and work with the neonatologist upon birth. So this proactive engagement really helps alleviate some of the stress that someone's going through when they receive this kind of diagnosis, which can be very terrifying. So we've talked about our program, how important it is to address things prenatally and postpartum, and all of the issues we're solving, behavioral health, social determinants, those important things that you identified on the poll. Now let's measure it. Now let's get into how are we driving those better outcomes? So we've got some great information. There are certain things we're looking at measuring in pregnancy as well as measuring postpartum. And it's, as you think about this, think about what you're looking for on your maternity report card or success dashboard. And so for one example, a reduction in maternal morbidities by 20% is what we're seeing. We're reducing NICU, so a NICU avoidance approach, decreasing that NICU admission, having babies that are healthier, right? So a larger birth weight or a higher gestational age. We're reducing C-sections by 25%, much lower than a benchmark of 34% in a population and reducing unwarranted NICU admissions. So we're making sure as women, the, the earlier they enroll, the better we're able to decrease that NICU admission. Healthier babies, right? So the goal is to have a baby that has a higher birth weight, decrease low birth weight babies, and decrease that healthcare utilization by mom, reducing ER visits. So we know some members are using the emergency room as a site of care where we wanna shift that back to the clinic, back to the provider and away from the ER. And all of this is leading to reducing maternal morbidities in the postpartum by having the support. When we look at NICU, so we didn't do a lot of NICU, but this is also an area where we're moving the needle quite a bit. From utilization management standpoint, we're avoiding inappropriate diagnoses. We know diagnoses codes all then lead to DRG assignment as well as outliers or inlier identification. So we're making sure the appropriate diagnoses are identified and coded as such. Um, we have been able to shift that. So if on average, you'll see a diagnosis um, baseline for a level of care from a high level of care. So a baby goes into the NICU, they say, it's, oh, it's a level four. This is a level four NICU. All the days should be level four. When in reality, that level of care designation is really based upon the clinical needs of the baby, not the location of the baby. So we're shifting that down and we're really seeing a huge difference where the higher acute days of 174 rev code is moving lower. Making sure through utilization management, following these babies concurrently, frequent reviews, and having conversations with providers peer-to-peer -peer with our teams of neonatologists and case managers to lower the length of stay appropriately and have safe discharge. Upon discharge, we're still following that baby, right? So there's a reduced readmission risk because we're engaging and shifting care as well to back to the provider and avoiding ER visits. And we have, just like maternity, we have a very high member enrollment, of 80%. So really, really nice movement towards how we're impacting maternity and NICU. With that, head into our wrap-up conversation. All right. So, so thank you, Dr. Gannon, and thank you for some of the questions we're receiving in the chat. Hopefully you at least accomplished, you've got an overview, you've got a common language and some of the, um, some of those statistics that are, um, heartbreaking and, um, and certainly actionable from our point of view, highlights on some of the postpartum strategy with prevention, right, being, being key here and also making sure that we're, um, we're, we're staying connected to those moms postpartum for as long as possible, ideally up to 12 months. So Linda, I'm going to have you take a look at the questions. One of them that's come in that I'll go ahead and answer. We had a, a question about engagement. We, we've all identified how important um, engagement is in our, in our work. And so how do we do with engagement? Well, Linda started that by talking about that building that trusted relationship. So our experience around engagement is it starts with outreach, 
right? We all know that we're measuring to successful outreach and then how many can you enroll? And so our progeny's experiences, we tend to enroll. Again, there's some slightly different for geography, a little bit different between Medicaid and commercial, but between 70 and 75% and in terms of enrollment in our programs. Um, of that, we, we tend to have between 80, 83% of what I'm gonna call sustained engagement, right? I've reached them. I've enrolled them, they've done some work with us, and now I'm gonna keep them engaged. It's not a one and done. I need to have actually a real interaction with them and then and, and we're consistent with that work. So um, we all know how important with all the different, um, uh, I guess, roles and responsibilities represented in our in our listeners, how important that, that engagement is. And so um, Dr. Gannon, um, as we talk about, think about maternity deserts yeah. and what's happening in that. Um, certainly, there's a lot happening um, in, um, across the country and our impact with that. Um, any, any thoughts on, 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 on the question? Yeah, I, I do see the question. It says, how has the repeal of Roe versus Wade increased maternity deserts? I have read that many OB guys are leaving the states with abortion bans and moving to other more liberal states due to fear of arrests and confusing and frequently changing abortion laws. So thank you for asking the question. There, the biggest concern besides an increase in maternity deserts is uh, access to care, of course, but lack of training in this, in how to do a DNC or a DNE as the appropriate clinical term. So that's one of the concerns that the OBs have. Besides having the maternity deserts, there will be less people who know how to do the procedure. And that's also something that they've said. I do think there, there will be mater increased maternity deserts as a result for various reasons, not just for this one, unfortunately. Um, so this is a, a very big challenge. There are people also staying so that they can provide care. So they realize that this could cause an increase in maternity desert in their area, but they are staying regardless. So it varies. I've heard both from various OBs. So thank you for asking that question. Um, a, a related question to that, I'll just I'll skip ahead, and I, as others are coming in, is really what is the, the broader question about what is the impact? And candidly, from a, a broader point of view, I think the, the role that we play in making sure we, um, we do give these um, moms to be um, um, access to information, access to care management, access to resources, and how can we support that? So what's really increasing in our world is just making sure people have information that they need in, in alignment with what the, the health plan's desires are and how we can best show up and care for them as we're talking about. We're having these conversations or different levels of conversations um, and redirecting them back to their provider. So certainly increased awareness all across the board, all across the board. Um, a next question relates to provider, provider relationships, both on the, certainly on the maternity side, Dr. Gannon and our work with the providers there, and certainly with the NICUs, but let's focus on the, on the maternity side and how our teams are working with the providers. You already, we're, we're certainly thinking about OBGYNs, but you also mentioned in the broader provider sense, we've got, you know, doulas and others that we're engaged with and midwives that are part of this whole continuum. So how are we in our maternity program really working with providers? Yeah, I'll give you an example. Um, we had a mom, who had bought progesterone cream from Amazon and she was rubbing it on her belly. Someone had told her, she had read on a website that this was, this is what she should do to prevent preterm birth. And when, and she didn't tell her provider this. So the provider didn't know that this was happening. So what happened was that our case manager engaged and reached out to that practice to let them know so that they could reinforce that she should not be buying medications off of Amazon they were thankful that we made them aware because she hadn't been honest with them about that. She felt intimidated in sharing that information. So I think that's one of the key things is that we're able to close the loop a little bit and give insight to the OBs when they are not aware of something that could be detrimental. Additionally, it's very difficult in the OB setting to get all that information about social determinants of health. So we are letting them know that someone might be in an unsafe home and they may have to be aware of that. We've had that issue come up quite a bit. At the same time, um, we may learn something that they're not aware of with regards to something that happened that they didn't, it's in between visits and they didn't have time to share that. So it's really closing that gap quite a bit as need be. In the postpartum period also, because things happen there, sometimes when someone isn't showing up, we do let the provider know, here's what's happening. She may, 
have had an issue, couldn't get transportation, let's help them reschedule. So there is a lot of back and forth as appropriate. We don't, at the same time, we don't wanna bother the provider too much and be too, because they know how, we know how busy the front desk can be. So we're mindful of how we're engaging and making sure it's with adequate information. Very good. Um, love, love the questions coming in. Thank you everyone for being engaged. And something tells me this is from, uh, from a health plan. Um, what's the what's the one thing a health plan can do to, to stay ahead of this? My, my, my reframing up to stay ahead of this. And I think Dr. Ginn and I would agree is you're doing part of it. Part of it is being planful, being proactive. Let's anticipate what needs to happen. Let's anticipate as your state may move to from you know, 60 days to, to 12 months. How do we stay ahead of that? And how do you have good partners to support your work, um, expand your own capabilities? But the biggest um, opportunity we here is to have here is to is to do something. And the first something to do is to um, um, figure out access to resources and how you can be most planful. Anything you round out that response with, Dr. Gannon? Yeah, I, know. I think the proactive preparation is so important because suddenly there'll be that expansion will come in and not to have that support in place for those members is certainly detrimental. So you, you definitely hit it right there. Very good. Well, um, so with that, certainly as we started this um, webinar with gratitude, we're going to end it with gratitude as well. And thanking you all for choosing to spend some of your valuable time with us. We're, we're here because we all know that this work matters. It's very impactful, certainly to, um, to many of us personally and those of us at Progeny Health, we're here because of the mission that we deliver on um, every single day. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, you're um, welcome to certainly reach out if Linda, you want to go to, um, I guess, the next slide. Yes, um, and, we'll share, and we'll share some of our contact information. Thank you again, um, MHPA, for your, your support of this. And um, thank you, everyone. Make it a terrific rest of your week. And I'll pass it back to you, Patrick. You, you know the Perfect. rules. <laughs> thank you very much, Jane. Um, Wow, that was a very informative presentation, frankly sobering too. That information I think is, is really important to get out. So I can't thank both of you and Progeny as a whole enough for um, presenting today. So thank you very much. Um, as we mentioned, if you're interested in the slides, the um, Progeny team will be following up with attendees. You can always, of course, contact them directly or MHPA will help you get in touch um, with them if you have any questions or wanna do follow up. Um, and, uh, you know, again, thank you to Progeny Health, um, one of our bronze partners um, next year. And I know this is a long time, but in October, um, we'll be at our annual conference. You'll be able to see them there as well in person. Um, and with that, you know, I want to thank all of our attendees for attending as well. And then please join us next week for another webinar Wednesday. So thank you again, guys. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank now. you. Bye-bye.